of the GOP. And uh, his his vice president signing that was all for jobs. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so, so just briefly, the debate is going to take place in several uh, stages or cycles. First, each team is going to make an opening statement. The evolutionists will make their opening statement first, followed by the um, creationists. Each team will have five minutes to make their opening statement. Second, the uh, the evolutionists will then proceed to give two distinct arguments in favor of their their position. In each case, they're going to have ten minutes to present their uh, their argument. After which time, the creationists will have five minutes for a rebuttal to that to that argument. The evolutionists will then have five minutes to uh, respond. Uh, after each round of argument, so there's two arguments. After each uh, round of argument, the floor will be opened up to questions for five uh, minutes. And what I'll do is I'll just get you to raise your hand. And if I pick you to ask a question, you can come up to the microphone at the uh, front. So after the evolutionists present two arguments, the creationists are then going to have their opportunity to offer two distinct arguments of their own. Uh, as in the case of the evolutionists, they'll have 10 minutes to present their argument, after which the evolutionists will have five minutes for a rebuttal, and the creationists will have five minutes for a response to the rebuttal, and then there will be five minutes for, uh, for questions. So after four rounds of arguments, two for each team, um, the, the floor will then be opened up for five final minutes worth of, of questions, after which each team will make a five-minute closing statement uh, statement and the closing statements will bring an end to to this evening's debate so just before we get started though with uh, this evening's debate I was asked to conduct a, an informal poll so we're going to try and see by show of hands how many people in the audience are uh, <coughs> are either ev uh, favor evolution creation or are undecided so let's start with uh, evolution who favors evolution okay a, a few people all right, how many people favor creationism? Okay, wow. Well. <laughs> some, some people are doubling up over here. Some people are doubling up. Any, in any case, so uh, undecided. Anyone undecided? A few? All right, well, uh, let's get started. So we'll have opening statements from the, from the evolutionist team to start. So uh, Roman just mentioned, mentioned to me, instead of two arguments in a row, we're going to alternate. So the evolutionist team will present an argument, then the creationist team, the evolutionist, and then the uh, creationist. Otherwise, the format is the same. Hello? All right. So from our point of view, there are two types of people in this world, those who accept evolution and those who do not yet understand it. To say that this debate is a creation versus evolution debate is almost dishonest as evolution only explains the origin of species once life has begun. So we must include abiogenesis, the origin of living matter from non-living matter. Um, so it would be more correct to say that this debate is between the origin of life and, and modern species through natural means versus supernatural means. We and the vast majority of scientists, through the examination of the wor natural world, have come to the conclusion that the universe we live in, along with all of its inhabitants, um, may have, can have arose, without the necessity for some grand creator. It is much more likely that life arose from non-living matter than from an immaterial mind of Yahweh as an afterthought. The theory of evolution is supported by virtually every field of science that exists, including geology, paleontology, biochemistry, and much more. With modern when modern genetics came around, it sought to examine the claims of evolution only to support it heavily. If a tree was drawn, up by genetic analysis and is superimposed onto a tree that would represent what Charles Darwin had proposed based off of be behavioral and morphological analysis, they would be very similar. This is a hallmark of good science, verification, test and retest. Let me take a minute to explain what a scientific theory really is. A, sci a scientific theory is only conceived once you've acquired enough facts to create a trend. This trend is then analyzed and the mechanism is then attempted to be explained with a theory. Most people are hung up on theory versus uh, fact when they do not, do not understand the difference. Theories are much more important because fa than facts because a fact in itself is just a truth and in itself is meaningless. A theory is much more useful as it provides 
the mechanism that allows for predictions of future events. It is the fact that something will fall to the ground 100 times out of 100 times. A theory is then developed based off these facts, in this case, the theory of gravitation. All supernatural claims are not science, and most begin with a theory and attempt to accumulate facts. This theory, this should sound familiar because creation, creationism is such a claim. If asked why a creationist thinks the way they think, they'll say simply because they read it in the Bible. Once they have acquired scientific, uh, their scientific theory, they'll attempt to uh, find facts that kind of sort of support their claim or stretch scientific truth while discounting unsupportive evidence. No supernatural claims can be tested and could therefore be anything because anything is possible in a delusion. The supernatural belief in crea creationism is much like saying that gravity is not what attracts masses. It's those blue broccoli elastics that you see at grocery stores that are infinitely undetectable by any means ever. They are just as testable and just as likely to be true. Another part of a theory, as mentioned before, is its application to fit all data to predict events. Evolution can distinguish itself further from creationism by making predictions. Creationism, creationists uh, cannot claim to have a predictive element. Another aspect of evolution is that it's many order, orders of magnitude simpler than creationism. The concept that Yahweh, a being of great impossibility, except in the context of religion, is cr has created everything that we see today, as well as placing all the animals in their particular habitats, and providing them with useless vestigial traits and suboptimal adaptations, which would later confuse most of mankind as to what really happened. Evolution f provides an elegant explanation as to the origin of modern species of animals. Evolution shows that more adapted organisms can arise from less adapted organisms due to selective pressures from the environment. This is commonly in the form of increasing complex complexity. Every day, uh, evolution becomes more and more apparent, and as the evidence stacks up, it seems to completely overshadow and negate creationist claims. They must concede to all things we have proven directly. The theory of evolution has been proven in a controlled laboratory setting with very strong confidence. These experiments were done on bacteria, so therefore creationists say, aha, but those are only single-celled organisms. So creationists make up terms like ma micro and macro evolution in their own context. Micro referring to evolution as applied to single-celled organisms and macro referring to um, the, evo the evolution of uh, more complex organisms such as mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. Let's, be, cur let's be, be clear right now. There is no difference and nor is there a reason for these to be different. As I've explained, scientific theories are universal in all areas that they apply. Evolution, uh, evolution applying to the uh, formation of more complex and better adapted organisms for the environment that they find themselves in. After this debate, I hope that you will accept evolution if you do not, do not already, and if you already do, then I hope that you've learned something. One thing that will become quite apparent as will be the blatancy of evolution as well as the stories of creation fading into bedtime mythology. All, twel all, all 12 pages of our references, which is around 240, will be posted on our website. Thank you. So now we'll have an opening statement from our creationist group. Good evening. I'd like to begin with a quote from the late evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. He says, our ways of learning about the world are strongly influenced by the biased modes of thinking that each scientist must apply to any problem. The stereotype of a fully rational and objective scientific method with individual scientists as logical robots is self-serving mythology. Ladies and gentlemen, the six of us standing before you tonight have spent hours examining the same data, <coughs> same arguments, and same rebuttals, yet we have come to completely separate and opposite conclusions. The explanation of how this can happen stems from this mythology of a fully rational and objective scientist, as Dr. Gould explained. Richard Lewontin, American evolutionary biologist, stated, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but, on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive Moreover, that mater materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Nuantin argues that restricting science to material causes is an a priori assumption, a Latin phrase which means based on hypothesis rather than experiment. A belief in science as the ultimate source of truth is defined by an underlying presumptive assumption that anything supernatural cannot be and therefore is not part of science. 
and a priori adherence to the tenets of materialism rejects the possibility of anything supernatural being a credible alternative. Methodological materialists have forced their pursuit of truth to exclude God as a possibility and therefore limited this pursuit even to the extent of the counterintuitive. The obvious question that arises is whether the same can be said of myself and the other representatives standing on the side of creation, and the answer is a definite yes. We are approaching this debate and the rest of our lives with the conviction that a sovereign, holy, all-powerful God of the Bible exists and has both physically and literally created the universe in six days. As a result, our view of science is affected by our beliefs. The point is that, put simply, everyone who has ever lived approaches life through the lens of their worldview, their personal set of convictions and beliefs about reality. Whatever shape that worldview takes, everything is seen through these a priori assumptions and therefore everything is tainted by them. The point is, er, the simple fact explains the seemingly confusing realization that two groups of scientists can look at the exact same evidence and come to such different conclusions. The evidence does not change, our interpretation of it does. The next question that log logically arises then is if we are looking at the exact same evidence as our skeptic friends, can we look at this evidence and point to the results of one single creator God? Well, if this world and universe is a creative act of God, we would expect to find morphological, anatomical, physiological, molecular, and behavioral similarities between organisms because they come from one intelligent creator. As described in the Bible, God created species according to their kinds, genetically robust yet distinct organisms that through the process of adaptation and the subsequent loss of genetic information would be able to radiate and become specialized for their individual niches. Organisms which could be traced back to the same kind then would be assumed to be more similar. As well, common traits such as conserved molecular domains and developmental processes would be expected to be similar due to their origin from a common creator. To use a simple analogy, Pablo Picasso's paintings are all characteristically similar of his style, yet each is also unique in its own way. Similarly, organisms all coming from the same creator would be expected to be similar in style, yet individually unique. Therefore, instead of standing opposed to comparative molecular, phylogenetic, and taxonomic data that has been collected by evolutionary biology, we interpret the same data to support the above expectation, namely, the existence of the creator God. Ladies and gentlemen, science is inherently limited to the material universe and has no way of explaining or defining anything outside of the natural realm. Therefore, when we talk about the origin of life, we cannot offer scientific evidence for the actual act of ex nihilo creation because this is a strictly supernatural act of God, but neither can be th there be any scientific evidence against this fact for the same reason. However, what we can do is show scientifically how this act would logically result in everything that we see today. A fully rational scientific method is impossible due to the unavoidable a priori assumptions of every scientist. As Ralph Waldo Emerson so aptly stated, people only see what they are prepared to see. Tonight our goal has nothing to do with winners and losers. Our hope and prayer is that each one of you will take a step back and look critically at the evidence that is being presented on both sides. Thank you. All right, so now we'll have our first argument presented on the uh, evolutionist side. All right, so um, first I'd like to say uh, I would love to prove God right. I'd love to prove it true, uh, but I, I can't. Um, and I'm going to give you evidence. Uh, I'm just here to convince you that abiogenesis is the only real way to uh, do the creation of the first organism. It's, uh, and it's scientific and rational, supported by evidence, and we've uh, uh, viewed all parts of it in the lab. Um, I'd like to say that first that we have far too rigid standards of what's life and what's not life. We have on one side rocks, crystals, things of that nature, and on the other side we have cats and dogs and people. But in between you have things uh, like viruses, where they aren't totally considered life. And you can see that by this clip of science. Um, I think it's important not to focus right now on the evidence for abiogenesis, but more the process. The, uh, I do have at least three peer-reviewed studies for each point I'm going to bring you up tonight. I can give it to you later if you'd, if you'd like, but it's more important right now to give you the idea that it is totally possible and probable that uh, life was created by totally scientific means, totally natural means. Um, we have 
haven't done a complete transform or transformation from non-life to life in the lab yet, but we have done each step individually. So we could do it in theory if we have had it set up right. Um, we we found found from studies showing that we have um, the conditions of Earth and whatnot on in early life that is almost inevitable for it to be true. Uh, the problem is we have a few theories, a few discrepancies in the in the very specifics of how abiogenesis works, like where it happens and whatnot. But all of the theories are very much the same. It's it's just a, it's not a matter of picking which one is perfectly uh, w which one is works. We have plenty that work. It's the one that actually happens is the question. And there are often some misconceptions. Uh, there's early life would not have um, been nearly as complex as the simplest life today. It would have been much simpler and uh, it would have caused um, the or, or more life coming from that would have uh, taken over the old one. It would have been taking up the same niche and would have taken over it. The, um, there would be no complex protein machinery. There would be no uh, complex fatty acids around the cell wall. Just basics uh, of reproduction and information storage. Uh, also, what I'm talking about is not does not affect evolution at all. I, even if abiogenesis is totally infeasible, which it isn't, <laughs> then you can. Um, <laughs> it does not affect evolution. It's sort of like saying that evolution as a theory is uh, is like saying uh, an umbrella doesn't predict hurricanes, so it doesn't work. Uh, you need to understand uh, abiogenesis is not a matter of likelihood. We know that it uh, could happen given enough time, and it's not a special property, just an emergent property of uh, proper sequences. All right, so uh, first you're going to have to <coughs> drop in that we use simple chemistry in the beginning of the uh, prebiotic earth. The, we know that this is true. We, I can give you evidence, uh, but again, I'm, you can see the references. Uh, it's, we're going to assume right now that uh, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide and phosphide were there in huge abundance. And it's arguing against this is pretty much like arguing against gravity. It's true. It's <laughs> um, so the first step in moving from non-life to life is uh, the production of monomers, which can happen from things like UV rays, radioactivity, the sun, hydrothermal vents, or electricity. And uh, they, they've been shown to be produced in huge quantities, even in the UV rays, harmful UV rays, and huge oxygen quantity uh, environments. We can, it makes fatty acids, which will be the cell membrane, and uh, nucleotides, which will be the information and the, uh, the acting proteins in the mix. Uh, th these nucleotides like to form together to make DNA, but they often have a hard time getting together, so uh, the, you need some sort of catalyst to make them work. You, that would be a clay crystal. Very clay is extremely abundant. They, uh, monomers would come together on the clay crystals, and uh, it's been shown that this happens, uh, and you come, come up with complex polymers once they go close enough together. Every now and then you get a special uh, a special kind of polymer called a ribozyme. It, uh, it actually works as the blueprint and the builder for it. It's a molecule that reproduces itself, catalyzes its own reaction. It's extremely interesting. <laughs> Modern nucleotides are too stable to work, so it wouldn't be something like DNA or RNA, but it would be more like a single strand of information or, I suppose, random structure of uh, nucleotides. Uh, recent experiments have shown that it's uh, that these spontaneously form. They can uh, change existing code. They can create new code just from these uh, ribozymes. And um, that's essentially, for me, I think it's life. It's reproducing, it's changing, it's evolving. But I'm guaranteed none of you agree with that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the problem here is we don't have any membrane. We don't have anything to contain it to protect it, to help it grow. But uh, it's, we can see that uh, even in uh, these harsh conditions, boiling temperatures, ridiculous amounts of pH level in either direction, they form uh, basic lipids that form the hydrothermal vents, uh, can form very nice membranes that can flex uh, nucleic acids. It's uh, the, the uh, free-floating amino acids are also, or the free-floating uh, fatty acids are incorporated into it, causing it to grow, the membranes to grow. These nucleotides stay within it, and they um, they can reproduce. They can, uh, when, and when these uh, cells grow large enough, they actually will uh, be mechanically split. They create two life structures, and they divide. So uh, we have a verified cell membrane that can grow, divide, 
uh, extremely similar to our own, and it can be shown over millions of years to evolve into it, into a complex, more, much more complex uh, um, cell membrane that we have today. So we have a self-sustained membrane containing uh, self-reproducing genetic code that can grow, divide, and adapt all on their own. So when does it become life? What are we missing? It's eating. It's eating. So uh, this is where it gets really cool. Lipid membranes give more genetic information. So this, you can see that's an adaptation at that point. Um, it will actually increase the pressure of the, uh, the membrane, and it will incorporate any other cells it can uh, interact with. It'll uh, form into one, make a much larger, better, cell that's essentially eaten. Um, membranes that contain polymers that reproduce faster and uh, are more efficient, more accurate, will divide faster and uh, eventually dominate the population. Early genomes were completely random and therefore contain no information. It was a symptom of their very structure that allowed them to replicate, grow, divide, and change, and then evolution happens. Uh, that's all. Very, uh, very basic systems that have been proven to form in basic early Earth that can eat, grow, contain genetic information, replicate, evolve through simple thermodynamic, mechanical, and electrical forces. No magic, no Yahweh, no incredible probability, no lightning striking a mud puddle, just simple proven chemistry. Thank you for listening. All right, so now we'll have a uh, five-minute rebuttal from the creationists. Genesis. We've just heard from the skeptics that this process, that it is a process from which life arose naturally. Um, and like we noted at the beginning, that it, th the origin of life is not encompassed um, within the theory of evolution, so I won't repeat that, which is fine. Um, but I just, I have a couple questions about this natural process. Um, where and how did the complex genetic instruction set programmed into DNA come into existence? In fields of molecular science, cell biology, cybernetics, there is an understanding that nucleotides come together and form a strand of RNA or pre-RNA, but there must be genetic instruction encoded into those nucleotides like ink on paper. The page alone is meaningless without the information. A natural process in question must have generated the following aspects of life. A genetic operating system with which to record programming instructions, a software itself to, for the production or assembly of every individual building block, and a coding system which will translate the triplet codon language into polyamino acids. So the issue here is that the natural processes have never been observed to write conceptual instructions. We must ask, how did in the in inanimate nature write these instructions to organize metabolism, write an operating system that, that will symbolically re re represent, record, and replicate those instructions, and how did it write the bijective coding scheme? We could uh, even uh, add a fourth question. How did inanimate nature design and engineer a cell capable of implementing these coded instructions? So, the skeptics have made a claim that given sufficient time, a genetic, instru like genetic instruction could have arisen. Um, a large amount of time does not provide an explanatory mechanism for spontaneously generated in genetic in information. What is needed is a plausible mechanism for natural process generation of functional algorithms. We need empirical evidence of prescriptic genetic information arising spontaneously without artificial investigative selection, for example, stellar. Also note that polymers also have have the tendency to break down thermally, thermodynamically um, over time. Also the claim that um, genetic information arose because of necessity, meaning like there is some type of natural me mechanism that we're overlooking that we're gonna get to at some point. The evolutionary instinct is that there must be some natural mechanism that we're overlooking which will explain the, the origin of genetic instruction. The claim that the genetic instruction arose because of necessity is incorrect. Natural mechanisms are all highly self-ordering. Massive amounts of data can be compressed in very simple algorithms in the laws of physics and chemistry, for example, F is equal to MA. However, no natural me mechanism reducible to law can explain the high information content of genomes. This is a mathematical truism, not a matter to be overturned by future empirical data. The claim that the genetic information could have possibly come from chance um, even, even if the primary structures mysteriously emerged at the same time, even if a random long sequence of DNA emerged and had the same sequences of genetic informa information, a cell is not a bag of enzymes. 
Without the machinery and protein workers, the message cannot be received and understood. And without the genetic instruction, the machinery cannot be assembled. And so Matthew was talking about the, the RNA world. The one thing that the RNA world conveniently bas bypasses is the translative coding issue. Retroviruses may have allowed RNA to become DNA at some point, and the DNA could take over as a more stable genetic instruction set, but retroviruses depend on reverse transcriptase, and this complex protein enzyme, like Matthew said, is not available in the RNA world. Also note that this conversion from RNA to DNA just still does not explain the origin of the initial RNA genetic programming. Dr. Trevers notes that the instruction set needed, needs protein synthesis to re replicate the instruction set and regulate cell division. As for the current research that's going on, all in vitro ribos ribosomic editing requires extensive artificial selection by humans like cells. Here the nucleotide sequence is deliberately manipulated and basically coaxed through many iterations to achieve the experimental goal. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I just don't want to take up too much time. Thank you. I'll just end with this. Uh, Dr. David Abel states this, neither chance nor necessity has ever been observed to program computational success, optimize algorithms, or organize physical entities into holistic conceptual pragmatic schemes. Yet we continue to believe blindly in the mystical capabilities of spontaneous mass energy interactions. The constraints did it, we proclaim. We believe this nonsense because we have no choice given our a priori commitments to naturalism. We are forced to, by this physio sorry, philosophical imperative to believe that undirected physicality could self-organize into the most exquisite organization and utility known to science, rather than reconsider the possibility of a long-standing Hunian paradigm rut, which we, cho we choose to hunker down in the obstinate fanatical physicalism. Don't trouble me with the evidence my mind is made up. Undirected f physical dynamics did it. Abel's honesty reminds me far too much of Proverbs 11.2, and I believe this applies to all of us as humans. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Thank you. All right, so now we'll have a five minute response from the evolutionist. All right, first I'd like to say, um, I addressed most of those things in my argument. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's like it was a script or something. Anyway, it was a priori, for one, the fact that um, you assume that just because it's now means that it was always. Uh, I, I mean, I, I explain how the, the, these uh, genetic co codes can come from just natural thermodynamic processes. I mean, I don't know how I, I could make it any clearer. It was, <laughs> it was, it was explained. Thermodynamics. The, the initial genome is random, and then things are things that do better are selected, and it gives you the illusion of design when really it's just a a, a combination of random chemicals that are not pulling their, their code or their instructions from any sort of creator. They're just their structure. It's like a water pipe. The water pipe is shaped like, a, like a, a, an, an L. The water's going to go around the L. It has nothing to do with intelligence. <laughs> uh, we, we have chemical evolution from the, the, uh, the, the basic nucleotides to the, the RNA and things beyond. We, we, and not necessarily RNA. You, you often have, uh, in the prebiotic world, you can often have things that are n use different nucleotides we don't even see today because they, uh, they were less common and we, it was evolved out. Um, there's, a, there's no necessity for genetic information. It's just, a, it's just an emergent property, something that happened because it could. It's like uh, a rock being eroded. It's just happening because it can. It's not like there's any need for light. There's no need for any intelligence. It's just something that happened. Uh, I don't see any reason to superimpose meaning on this. Um, <laughs> you're equivocating information, for one. It's not information. It's just the structure. It's like saying you, uh, this scene right here is information. If I take a picture, it's information, but it's not information. It's just the scene. It's just the structure of what is here. It's not, <laughs> it's not information. I'm sorry. I can't say that enough. <laughs> the, uh, we can, and and we've, we have great uh, examples. We've observed this happen many, many times. I have 240 studies, at least. <laughs> and those are just the ones I found. <laughs> uh, we have uh, enzymes that can flawlessly incorporate into the RNA world. You can build uh, these ribozymes that I was talking about. You can build secondary structures, like enzymes, and uh, those can help with encoding. They can go flex like em or amino acids that they need to, to 
build proteins. It's, it's, you can, you can see, uh, I, I cut this right out of my, I, I should have known. <laughs> it's, there's a really small level enzyme incorporation that you can have right after the ribosome. And it explains the transition from the RNA to DNA. You can see that it's, the DNA was built as a secondary structure. It's in initially as a, a more hard-coded version. It, it eventually, you know, took over, it transitioned just because of the evolution. And we have, pro it, 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 what was that quote? That we've, that we've never had uh, randomness come up with anything smarter, in, improve algorithms. We've come up with w walking robots based on just random natural selection. Uh, it was simulated on computers. We have great, like, things we could never even come up with. And it's right there. We have tons of programs. I, I don't even, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> just all, all of the things you just said. It's, it was undeniably false. And it, it was either ignorance or lying, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so now we'll open, up, open it up to the floor for, uh, for questions for about five minutes. So if you do have a question, maybe raise your hand. Uh, yeah, Stephanie? Sorry, real quick. Okay. Yeah, use the microphone. Um, I have a question for the creation side. Um, I liked how when you were talking about abiogenesis, you mentioned that no scientist has ever really seen that process, but I liked how then Mackie came back with a, his point that he had, correct me, 247 demonstrating, I'm guessing, small parts of this process? Okay. So that's an entirely scientific principle, <laughs> um, which is really great that I think you're um, applying the methods of science to abiogenesis. But has anyone ever seen creation? what happens afterwards is logical and follows, then that proves the original text correct. I'm saying that th a supernatural event cannot be proven or disproven okay. by science. So that actual event is outside the realm of science, but we can mm -hmm. show you what would logically follow from that. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead, sir, if you want to come up and ask. Um, folks, I appreciate all, all what you're doing here. Um, as an ex-monotheistic evolutionist, I used to um, side with yourselves. Um, one of the issues that came to me or where I struggled was when you deal with self-awareness and man's ability to be aware that we are aware. And how can one evolve into that? And how can one evolve into the knowledge of right or wrong? We can watch animals be born and put off to the side by the, uh, the mother bearing the child, or bearing the child, bearing the kitten or whatever to die because they don't understand right or wrong and there's no repercussion. And I'm not sure how I could fit that in. And in fact, over the years, as I've studied it more and more, I've swayed further and further and further to that side um, citing even things like the eye. We talked about receptors, we talked about things that can um, analyze and, and process, and yet with something as simple as an eye, 
then how would you say that it evolved with the brain to process with an eye to give the information? How do you simultaneously have that happen and not, not until it happened have all the energy that that organism was using put it at a disadvantage to the other organisms that are vying for food or for whatever element, okay, uh, until both those, those items were working simultaneously together? Thank you. Well, I figure I'll take the consciousness one because I know quite a bit about it. Um, but Keegan, do you want to take the eye one? Or? All right, okay. So the consciousness thing is, uh, there's actually some studies going on right now about the levels of consciousness, about how it's observed. Um, we can see in rats, they can identify a reflection of themselves. That's a stage two consciousness. It's, uh, it's where you can see, you can observe yourself. Um, we have what we call stage six consciousness. It's, uh, it's a matter of us being able to see uh, ourselves, or see somebody else, seeing us, see them, you know, it goes back and forth like that. It's the uh, idea that we can observe something else. The, uh, the, the idea of self-awareness is simply us observing ourselves and knowing we're there. It's, uh, it's, it's observed, the, the several stages are observed in different animals that you might more consider more intelligent. Um, sorry, uh, it wasn't really topical to the abiogenesis, though. Uh. Well, we actually had a quick, we only about a minute. Yeah, okay, sorry, Keegan, you want to take it? I'm just going to say that I will cover uh, in the evolution portion of our argument. I will answer uh, the second question. Okay, so the, the uh, second part of the question will be addressed later on. For now, we're going to move on to our first argument from the creation side. As a third-year biological science major, I cannot tell you how many times I have had the scientific method taught and explained to me. The method is universal, timeless, and incredibly valuable in its ability to determine causes and effects in the natural world. Simply stated, if you want to explain an effect by the historical scientific method, it therefore means explaining it by reference to a cause that is known to produce the effect in question. In other words, the scientific method explores causes that are known to produce specific effects. Now, in this argument, we will attempt to apply the same scientific method to the question of the origin of biological life. The central question in the study of the origin of life is in regards to the origin of the information that makes life tick, so to speak. Any biology student would be quick to affirm that information literally runs the show in biology. Now, I understand that most of you probably are not biological science majors like myself, so I believe a quick explanation of what we mean by biological information will be helpful to the, to the delivery of our argument. As most of you, I'm sure, know, the main memory bank or storehouse of information in the cell is DNA. The massive molecule contains the majority of the genetic material that is used to control literally every part of the functioning process known as life. DNA codes this information using four nitrogenous bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. The specific ordering of these bases is copied during the process of transcription to create specific mRNA strands, which in turn are processed with the specific sequences of their bases giving direct rise to the order of amino acids that make up any given protein through the process of translation. The specific order of amino acids forms a highly specialized protein. Proteins put simply run the cell. They function as enzymes, receptors, transcription factors, etc. So this is a quick summary of what we mean when we are referring to biological information. That information which is encoded digitally by the sequence of bases in the DNA molecule, other parts of the genome, and beyond. Returning to what was being described earlier, remember that the scientific method seeks to explain an effect such as information by reference to a cause that is known to produce the effect in question. Therefore, in applying the scientific method to the question of the origin of life, we need to find a causal ex explanation for this biological information. If explaining the origin of life, one must explain all of its noticeable and important features, the most important of which undoubtedly is the presence of digital information. So the important question becomes, where does that information come from? How did this important feature of life arise? At this point in the argument, I would like to turn to Darwin and Lyell, believe it or not. Both gentlemen firmly advocated that we should explain the past by our knowledge of presently acting causes. Now remember, we are looking for causal explanation for biological information. So using Darwin and Lyell's logic, our question becomes, what is the presently acting cause of digital code and information? Well, we all know the obvious answer to that question by repeated and uniform experience, which it is important to note is the basis for all scientific reasoning about the past. We know that information always comes from an intelligent source. We know from experience that whenever we want to confer new functionality to something, for example, a computer, we must give it code. 
Therefore, using Darwin's logic, we can clearly see that if we want to explain the past by our knowledge of presently acting causes, we come to the conclusion that information always comes from an intelligent source. Therefore, it follows by deductive reasoning that the information necessary to build the first life must have come from an intelligent source, namely from our point of view, the creator God. Now, at this point, it's important to dig a little deeper into the concept of information. We must understand that biological information is, not, is found not in the physical makeup of DNA, but specifically in the precise order of the base pairs found in the DNA molecule and the subsequent order of bases in mRNA and amino acids and proteins. Dr. Werner Gitt attempts to fully characterize this concept of information by investigating five levels of information. The five aspects are statistics, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and apobetics. Information is represented that is transmitted and stored as a language taking the form of ink on a page or bases in a DNA molecule. From a defined alphabet, the individual symbols are assembled into words, statistics, the first level of information. From these words, each word having been assigned a meaning, sentences are formed according to the firmly defined rules of grammar, syntax. These sentences are the bearers of semantic information. Furthermore, two final levels of information are required. The action intended, pragmatics, and the desired goal, apobetics. These both belong as necessity to the concept of information. And now it is effortless to apply these five levels to, of information to the biological information found in the DNA molecule. Statistics, the first and bottom level of information, is the bridge between the material and the non-material world. This would be the actual physical presence of nitrogenous bases. Syntax encompasses the structural characteristics of the way information is represented. In the case of biological information,